we got we got some cool stuff to do. Um, we're gonna be able to draw pictures soon, okay? Um, for this Ramsey model, okay? Face space diagrams kind of stuff. Um, so let's see, where were we? Last time I think we like almost solved the Ramsey model. Let's see, let me show you what I'm seeing here. Yeah, so here we are. Um, so last time we derived <clears throat> basically this equation, these two equations on the left here, all right? This uh, equation de describing the evolution of consumption and this equation describing the evolution of assets. Okay, so we're still, um, you know, the, the setup here is that we solve the consumer's problem in terms of asset choice A, uh, consumption, uh, given a path of interest rates R of T and a path of wages W of T, okay? And that's a valid problem regardless of whether it's a general equilibrium model or just a, just that's a, a micro level problem, right? So that's like the micro level given the macro level uh, endogenous variables like the interest rate and the wage, okay? And then we kind of close the loop after that, okay? And that's like market clearing, okay? Um, and so the close the loop means we have, we impose, well, R of T actually is the marginal product of capital and wage is actually the marginal product of labor, okay? Which which is an assumption of, of competitive markets basically. Uh, and then also that asset level is actually capital, okay? So they basically, the, the assets before were just, kind of money in the bank, but now we're saying, well, okay, well, banks, they, I mean, how do they generate returns? Well, they do it by, you know, kind of owning physical capital and renting it out. That's one interpretation. Uh, or you can think about it as they own shares or uh, yeah, shares in companies that operate physical capital and they get return on the, uh, like dividends on their shares and they pass it to you, the saver or the borrower or whatever. Okay, so so the bank, I mean, connects, the bank should at some point connect with the fiscal economy, okay? And they're, they're just an intermediary. Uh, and so then the idea is that these, these assets really are capital in the end, okay? Each, um, each yeah, unit of the asset corresponds to a, a unit of physical capital, okay? Uh, yeah, okay, so then that's, Let's see. How do we? Yeah. So that that's like kind of equilibrium. What is that? That is a highlighter, I guess. Let's not do that. Um, let's do this. Uh, so that would be like equilibrium. But also, I don't. I'm gonna do the fine tip. Okay, equilibrium. That's a word. Let's say that's a word. Uh, the lag, lag's okay. Um, all right, so so the equilibrium is going to be uh, basically. I mean, this is this is not one hundred percent exact, but you know, essentially um, R. Okay, so well, let me skip R. All right, there's there's a little bit of nuance that I want, that I need to get into, but for W, you know, it's going to be the marginal product of labor. Okay, so. Um, Have I said anything? Yeah, so now the, the only thing I want to note here is that we don't have technological change. Okay, we have population growth. But we're not going to have technological change. Okay, yet. We can have that later on, but we're not going to have that yet. Okay, because with, with just population growth and no technological change, your wage should converge to something. Okay, it's not... With technological change, the wage should grow, right? That's That's where you get, like, good, you know happy 20th century exponential growth in in productivity and also wages which you, you don't actually see after like 1980 the median wage kind of flatlines that's like a bit of a unfortunate fact in a lot of ways uh but in the model you would so that's what we got so far we can we can talk about the real world in a bit okay so um yeah so that's that's your wage for now it's not going to be going up because there's no technological change uh the interest rate. Okay, so the interest rate. Um, there's a little bit of a wrinkle here because of the depreciation. Okay, it's just accounting, really, right? But we have this notion of a lowercase r, which is the interest rate, and a capital R, which is we're, we're going to call the rental rate on capital. Okay, so um, 
think imagine you're a bank this this is where the interpretation is not a Everything I'm going to do is sort of invariant to exact interpretation, but to d describe how we could, how we think about this, it's it's good to stick to one interpretation. So let's say that the bank um, owns capital and they rent it out to firms. Okay, now maybe they don't physically bring it back to the bank at the end of every day and then send it out again, right? I mean, so this is on paper, right? But let's say that they kind of own it and they rent it out to firms. Um, so, uh, yeah, so if, if you're a firm, okay, and you want to rent it, well, you need to, you, you have to pay the rental rate on capital, but also, like, you know, when you, when you rent a house, like, if you read the contract, which, I mean, who does, really? I mean, you, you skim it. Um, but it's a, bit, a lot of the contracts, I think in PA, there's a sort of a standard, standardized contract format, which is like, you should give the house back to the landlord in the condition that you got it or something to that effect, right? So that means that um, if you break it, you should somehow fix it or pay for it to be fixed or probably they'll just steal your security deposit. Um, or, you know, wear and tear, you should probably vacuum it occasionally, stuff like that. So depreciation, you're kind of expected sort of to, to pay for it, right? Uh, if, if you're going to give it back in the same condition that you, you got it, right? So um, So that's why we need to factor that in. So let's see. Now the question is, do we add it or subtract it? And honestly, I don't know, because I, I can never I have I have binary confusion issues. Okay, let's let but let's work through the the logic. Okay, the interest rate. I know I'm going to get this wrong, but okay, okay. So the interest rate is okay. Here, here, let's say this for sure. This is true. The rental rate on capital is we're going to define as the marginal product of capital, okay? Um, and so then the interest rate, if you want to borrow, I think it should be, let's try minus. The slides will tell us the answer. I hope. It's definitely in there somewhere. So we, we went through all this basically. This is what we went through. Um, and then when we get to equilibrium, yeah, here we go. <clears throat> if you look at there, little R of T is big R of T minus delta. Okay, so, um, yeah, that's what I wrote. Okay, so, what does that mean? And then, so the other way to think about this, of course, is that capital R is equal to R plus delta. Okay, so, Yeah, I mean, I guess the way you can think about it is that the rental rate on capital is um, you're paying for the marginal return that you're going to get because it's competitive, and also you need to account for you need to like make up for depreciation. Okay, so you got to you got to give it back in the condition that you got it. Okay, so you can think about it as like a yearly model, let's say. So maybe it's ten percent depreciation. You need to either like buy new capital and like give that to them back, or you need to just like give them the money and they can do it themselves, right? So. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, so at the end, but at the end of the day, that, that capital R is sort of the physical marginal product of the capital. And then on top of that, you have paying for depreciation basically. Okay. Um, okay. So then, but then the R, <clears throat> yeah, so the, but then the R that the consumer would see is a little R, right? That's this. And so that's saying, um, the, I guess the way to think about that is you get a return, or a physical return, but then you kind of lose stuff through depreciation. Because right? if you own the asset and it depreciates by ten percent, you're out ten percent, right? You are, you're in the whatever physical return you get on production, but you're out that ten percent. You don't you don't as the owner get compensated, I guess. Okay, um, which is yeah. It's not intuitive, honestly, but but it's just accounting, basically. All right, I mean, someone has to pay. Someone has to pay for the depreciation. Okay, could be you, could be the landlord, but yeah, um, someone's got. In this case, I guess we're saying that you're paying for it in some sense. The own, yeah. Um, well, no, we're we're the landlord, I guess. The consumer is the landlord, which is kind of confusing. But we're the landlord, and and we're kind of paying for it. Okay, so, um, 
yeah, but that that's okay. So what, what that's going to do basically though is connect up uh, these prices, R and W uh, factor prices, with with the production side. Okay, um, and then the other thing we need is like uh, market clearing, I guess you could call it, which is just that, or just I don't know. It's just consistency, really aggregate consistency, which is just that A is equal to K. Okay, that th those. Um, assets out there all correspond to physical capital somehow, right? Because um, uh, think about it like this. There's imagine there was a path of physical capital, right? And then you had people making a bunch of asset decisions and A wasn't equal to K. So that means basically the markets are not clearing. That, that those there's capital that's either not spoken for by a consumer or uh, there's too much kind of claims to capital that more than actual capital there is, which is also problematic. So it's not market clearing. So then the interest rate should adjust. OK, the interest rate is going to modulate how much people want to borrow. Uh, so the interest rates higher, people are going to want to save more or borrow less. Uh, if it's lower, they're going to want to borrow more or save less. OK, and so that's going to that's the, the idea is that R should vary such that a equals k at every point in time. Okay, so that's that's an intuitive way to think about this equilibration process. Okay, um, of course we we don't give any equilibration process, right? We just say here's an equilibrium. We don't say how we get there. Could be wall raise an auctioneer or something like that, which I always like to imagine. Um, and at some point I will go as a wall raise an auctioneer <clears throat> for Halloween, maybe this year. I don't know. We'll see. Um, and uh, it could be that. Could be any number of things. But we're not. We don't. We don't give. A process for equilibration. We just say there's an equilibrium, and we like end up exactly there, time zero, boom. All right. So, um, yeah. And then with regards to the wage, well, so pe people aren't really making uh, labor decisions here. Okay. So they're just they just work all the time, or like a fraction of the time, let's say. Right. There's no uh, labor supply decision, um, but uh, there is labor demand okay firms are demanding labor basically okay um so we still want we need the demanded labor to equal the supply the supply is fixed the demand is variable so then if you modulate w you modulate how much firms are demanding and that should eventually you know equilibrate uh supply and demand on the labor side okay so there, there's still there's still supply and demand for labor for capital through r and through labor through w and those are equilibria okay um they're, they're joint um, in the sense that W W will influence how much you uh, save and borrow through an income effect, right? Not not a price effect, but an income effect. Uh, so it's not like they're di it's a, it's not a diagonal system, is what I'm saying. The, you, you know, anytime I give these intuitive stuff about equilibration on the diagonal, you know, it kind of, it makes sense. And that's the dominant dynamic, but also like there's off diagonal stuff. So it's like, if you change the wage, well now, now the, the asset market doesn't clear anymore. And so it's like, you need to, you need to do this jointly really. Um, but, but intuitively it's easiest to think about the diagonal elements, right? And the, those are going to be the largest effects if you want to think about it like that. Okay. All right. So, okay. So, so we, we basically have our, our work, cut out for us we have everything we just need to put it together because remember we we calculated all this these these marginal product things like you know remember the the r was relatively simple taking the derivative here it just gives you like little f prime of k and this one you had to be a little tricky you just homogeneity of degree one uh, sorry i was pointing at the wrong screen um this one you need to be tricky and use homogeneity degree one this one was was relatively easy okay so we we have this uh you know in our pocket we're going to apply this. This we proved before. Just need to bring it all together. Okay. Um, all right. Unfortunately, I've run out of page space. So then we go to a new page. Uh, but let me. Okay. So so what do we have? We have C over C is R minus. Sorry. So that that would have been true for log. Um, what do we have? Uh, we have R minus rho over theta. Okay. So well. I'm going to do this for CRA, you know, I, going forward, if I write theta, like that could just easily as well have been epsilon U of C. Okay. Um, but it's just easier to write theta. Okay. 
Um, yeah, so remember though, this is the general form. We derive the general form uh, up here, okay? Where we had like these, all these derivatives of utility and stuff like that. And I was like, oh, we can just, this is just elasticity. That's a notion that we have sitting around from, you know, wherever. Uh, and so we can just sort of use notation to simplify this. And then on top of that, in the case of CRA, which is like a really common um, utility function to use in macro at least, this is actually just exactly that CRA parameter theta. Okay, so I'll write theta, but it could be, you know, epsilon u. Now, there's one wrinkle, which is that that's fine if we're just doing algebra. If we take a derivative of that thing though, then it's a little different because if I take a derivative of this with just theta, theta is a parameter. If I take a derivative of epsilon u, let's say with respect to time, well, that's potentially time varying because epsilon u is potentially varying with c. So it's complicated. So as long as I don't take a derivative, I'm just doing algebra, it's fine to just use theta. But once you start taking derivatives, like when we look at stability, then it's going to matter. Okay, so I'll, maybe I'll revert back. But for now, I'll just write theta. Okay, so that's r, r minus rho over theta. Okay, um, a dot was uh, r minus n times a plus w minus c. Okay, that's basically a budget, uh, budget constraint. Um, and then... What do we have? So R is minus the product of capital. We, we found a, a while ago that this is just F prime of K. Right? We, we proved that in like solo world, but it's still true, okay? And then W is this. This one is uh, F of K minus, um, Let's write k times f prime of k. That's what we derived before. That's where we use homogeneity to degree one. Okay. You move that second term over to the other side, it also turns into like a, uh, a macro level GDP equation, which says that output is equal to wage times labor, which is one normalized plus capital times the interest rate. Okay. So it's like an uh, income is either going to, to <clears throat> wages or to capital. And that's good. the sum of those is equal to total output. Okay. So this is actually equivalent to a GDP style uh, accounting income equation. All right. But that's what we need for now. This, this tells us if you want to think of this, am I pointing at the right thing? Yes, I am. Okay. So I need to point it like my, not, there's a bunch of screens going. I need to point the right thing. So if you want to think about of t being on all of these, it's like r of t is of t because k is varying with time and map that through f prime, okay? w is varying with time because k is varying with time and all this stuff. Yeah. So there's no explicit time over here, but it's all going through changes in k, which is good because we have, yeah, I mean, it, it's a closed system, okay? There's no external forces acting on it, okay? So um, that's good. And then the other thing is, um, R is capital R minus delta, okay? Which is, you know, F prime of K minus delta, okay? So that's just like, this This is really just a, it's kind of a definition in a way. Um, it, it's something you need to kind of intuitive, intuit, um, but yeah. Okay, so that's but that but little r is what we have in the uh, budget equation of the left. So that's why we need to know little r. Okay, so um, all right, so we have that. We can we're gonna sub from right to left, and then and then finally we're also gonna sub a equals k. So we're gonna sub all those things on the right into the left hand side equations, and then we're gonna be good. That's gonna be great. All right, so so let's do that. So c to over c. Little r is f prime of k minus delta minus rho over theta, okay? And then the second equation, k dot, right? So now this immediately, a, a equals k immediately applies a dot equals k dot, right? This is true, it's just, we take a derivative, okay? Um, yeah, now the other way, is almost true, but you need to worry about the initial condition, right? The, going from a dot equals k dot to a equals k, they have to have the same initial condition, right? So going right is always true. Going left is like kind of true, but you just need to worry about that initial condition. Okay, so uh, yeah, little r. Um, 
there we go, this simplifies, that's why. Okay, so this, let, but let's plug it in. So f prime of k minus delta, sorry. So that's a little r, and then we have that minus n, can't forget about that. Then we have a, which is actually k. Then we have w. So this is a little bit more complicated, but it actually simplifies. W is f of k minus k, f prime of k, as we see above. All right, and then minus c. Okay, so we just, just like sub in everything we know, okay? Now, you'll see though that there's a f prime of k times k term in the first one, that first very first term, if you factor through on the parentheses, is, is k times f prime of k, then that, that also shows up over here. And it's a, with a minus sign here and a plus sign here. So those are actually gonna cancel, beautiful. Um, so then we're gonna, what are we left with? Well, we still have that f of k, that's like output. We're gonna have minus basically delta plus n, sorry. Yeah, minus, yeah, there's two, they each have a minus, so minus delta plus n times k and then minus c, okay, and that's k dot, all right? Okay, so that's k dot. Um, you, know, you, you can simplify this one up top, uh, f prime, a very slight simplification, but you know, delta plus rho, that's like your effective discount or something like that um, over theta. Okay, so these are two equations. Okay, I mean, just for completeness, you know, we can write it like this if you want. Um, I don't know, one over theta times f prime of k minus. Okay, so this is like in its full glory, the the 2D system. Okay, let me, that's that's easier. The 2D system, right? So we in uh, in in k k and c, right? So this is given k and c, we can tell you precisely how they're evolving. Okay, it's a uh, for the full rank system, it's not diagonal, right? So k, both k prime or k dot and c dot depend on both k and c, okay? Um, although the growth rate of c only depends on k. That's there's a sort of a log diagonally there diagonalization going on there, but basically they're they're not diagonal systems, um, so they're not separable. Um, so it jointly evolves, okay? So this is, but this is their system, okay? Once once we sub in everything. That's our system, and this is including optimization by the the individual uh, or the, the household or the commune, and it's including market clearing, prices, assets, capital, everything like that. Okay. Um, <clears throat> yeah. So that's so. So now, what do we do? Okay. Uh, there's sort of a a process. Okay. There's a couple of things lurking in the background. So one one thing is. Well, okay, on the, from the optimization, first of all, there's still, there's still the transversality condition. We'll talk about that later, but it holds basically, especially in this case, because we're not growing. We're not, we're, not going, we're not going off to infinity, anything like that. So the, the transversality condition you can, you can verify basically does hold, and it essentially comes down to uh, the assumption that um, rho is greater than n. That, that basically, which is, which means that your t utility function itself is well defined because the exponential is the negative. Okay, your effective discount rate is negative, so that holds. Um, I'm not going to do that now because it's, it's not that important, really, and it's it doesn't flow well. It's just kind of painful. All right, so so we're going to push that off until like we're going to run a Ponzi scheme, and I'm just going to push that off every lecture until the next lecture, basically. But there's a terminal condition because the class is only a finite length of time. We'll see what happens. Um, sort of meta in that way. So, uh, okay. So then we'll ignore that for now. Um, anything else lurking in the background? Uh, yeah, there's some, there, there are certain calculations you can do um, from the consumer optimization about the, what exactly the path of consumption looks like. So, so, but basically with this consumption path, this is saying that consumption is growing at a certain rate, right? So if, uh, let's see, if R, this R here, which is really, I guess, let's go up here. 
if this r up here was constant, okay, this is just saying that c is growing exponentially, okay? Um, and if you know the path for c, okay, uh, you, you know basically everything about c except the initial c0, which is a choice, okay? So... So I, this is really thinking about how do we how would how would we fully solve the the consumer optimization? Just stepping back a little bit. If in, in the case where R is constant, it says it's grow, either growing or shrinking exponentially. That's the differential equation here. And the only thing we don't know is C zero, which is still a choice. Okay. So what we do is okay. We we know that C is is growing exponentially. We we have a budget constraint. We have an initial condition. So we have a zero. but we don't really know C0, okay? So what we do is say, okay, well, guess C0. Guess C0. Okay, use that differential equation to find CT, which is gonna be some exponential. Even with R varying, it's just that it's a sort of a pseudo exponential thing. Um, plug that into this equation here, uh, knowing that we know a zero, we can solve kind of solve this. Okay, um, given w constant or given w of t, we can still solve it because that was, um, you know, that, that this is a, a linear differential equation. It's it's non-stationary, but it's 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 doable. Um, and then once we have a t, then well. we'll we will basically, uh, how do I say this? You need to ensure that um, your your assets in the limit kind of don't explode, okay? And so, so like, let's call that like A infinity should be zero, okay? And it turns out that there's exactly one C zero that satisfies this, okay? So if you choose C0 too large, let's say you choose a large C0 and R is greater than rho. And so you're, you're growing exponentially, okay? Uh, so in that case, right, um, you're gonna have a pretty large uh, asset position, okay? Um, sorry, a pretty small asset position because that's your consumption is coming out of assets, right? With this minus C, okay? And so your, your A0 is gonna be very negative, okay? Um, if you choose C0 equals zero, you don't consume anything ever, well then you're gonna just have your initial assets for, for all time uh, plus any growth here, okay? So this is, A, A infinity is gonna be fairly large, okay? So there's some initial value C0 that's gonna exactly satisfy your budget equation in the long run, okay? It's not, I mean, it's weird because it's, it's a, it's a boundary condition at infinity. Okay. But it's, it turns out that it basically works. Okay. So, um, yeah, uh, I should, it, it actually, okay. That, that's the semi-intuitive explanation. If you do the algebra, it's, it's a little painful, but it actually makes a little bit more sense because you can get, um, like a specific equation for a infinity. Okay. We'll do that later. All right. So we'll do that later and we'll talk about how, how to work how to work through that okay but for now i mean we're, we're already kind of in equilibrium okay we have this system of differential equations and we could just analyze that okay so let's but let's do it in two steps so first there's um there's a notion of steady state okay actually i can just move this so there's a notion of steady state where these two things are not moving around over time, where k dot, k dot equals zero and c dot equals zero, okay? So k dot equals zero. Um, well, it just means that consumption is equal to f of k. So, I mean, it's that this equation here equals zero, which means that consumption is f of k minus delta plus n times k. So all that means is if, for k dot to be zero, for your capital to be not moving around, your consumption is just, well, your investment is just perfectly counteracting depreciation, right? So, so this is I. 
This is like a little I, which is capital I, everybody. So your investment is perfectly counteracting depreciation. And in this case, it's like it's normalized depreciation. So delta plus N times K. And then you consume whatever is left over of output, which is here. Right? So so C equals Y minus I is always true. That's accounting. Uh, and then it, it is the steady state thing is just saying, well, the investment is equal to depreciation. Okay, so so that's what that um, means, but that's that's a you know, specific equation there. All right, and then uh, c dot equals zero. That's you know we're also steady stationary in terms of c. Um, well, that if you look up there, I mean you have th this this as long as c is not zero, right? Which is going to be true. It just means that f prime of k equals delta plus rho. So. Okay, remember that f prime of k is is uh, is r is the interest rate. So this is saying the interest rate is equal to delta plus rho. All right. So, um, right. Okay. So and and actually, you know, so that's that's in purely in terms of of c and k. All right. Um, and so what you do is you solve for k first on the bottom equation, then you plug it back in and, and find c. Okay. So you can find it. You know, eventually, because k the k part is separable, you plug it in and you find c. All right. Uh, the other thing though is like, remember, r r is is f prime f prime of k. So r is equal to delta plus rho. Okay. But r is also e remember just by definition r is equal to what was it? R plus delta. Little r plus delta. Okay, so that, that in net that just means that that uh, little r is equal to rho, right? Because r, capital R is delta plus rho, and little r is big R minus delta. So the little r is just rho at the end of the day. Okay, that that's what that condition means in terms of prices. Okay, and if you go back up top to our original equation, sorry I'm jumping around here, but if you go back up top. R equals rho, that just gives you c dot equals zero up here too. So, so, you know, this this equation is saying you're going to grow exponentially positively or negatively, um, uh, depending on the relative value of r and rho. And if you're in steady state, I mean, it must be that r equals rho, and you're gonna you're gonna stay exactly at that level of consumption. Okay. In, in the short run, things are going to be different as you vary your consumption, but but in in steady state, you need r equals rho. Okay. And that's you, you. You saw probably a similar result in uh, in discrete time, right? In in before, right? So that's that's analogous. Um, okay, so so that's steady state. Okay, and so now the thing is that steady state here. This is a joint steady state that I'm just talking about here, where both C and K are not moving around over time, right? And that gives you exactly one point in C K space, C star K star. That's your steady state. Okay, but we can. We can kind of generalize this and think about these two steady state conditions as independent conditions in some sense, all right? So, and this is where we get to draw pictures. So let's visualize CK space, all right? And what we're gonna have is K on the X axis and C on the Y axis. And I'm gonna bring up the slide for this because I generally screw things up. So so uh, this, this picture is sort of like accurately to scale displayed in the slides too. If you want to check it out there with colors, even I, I could do colors actually. Why not? Um, so yeah, uh, maybe I will. So okay, we have C and K space, all right? So every, every any we're moving around in the space. What these equations up here tell us is how to move around in that space. You know, sorry for any point that I drop, they'll give me an arrow and tell me where to go. All right. Now we've decided that there's a steady state, C star, K star. All right. Um, and then we have these two conditions, okay? And the steady state is where these, these, these two conditions define lines in the space. This is a vertical line where K is fixed. I'll draw in a second. This is a proper plot of C of K, a, a, a curve, right? Um, and then C star, K star is where those two curves intersect. Okay, so let's uh, let's do that. I'm gonna use I'm just gonna use the same colors as on the slide. So so that um, c dot equals zero condition 
it says f prime of k equals delta plus r, which gives basically says that it's a vertical line at k star. Okay, so this is k star. Oh. All right, so this is going to be k star. Okay, and that that's that c dot equals zero condition. Right? Does that make sense? So, so that's that k k b will be a fixed value means it's a vertical line. Okay, since k is on the x-axis. Um, and then we're going to do a little Christmas colored scheme here. Uh, we can also draw uh, the k dot equals zero line. So let's, um, so, okay, so what, what is that? And that's that's um, this c equals f k minus delta plus nk. This is our k dot equals zero curve. Um, so this says, well, this, this is uh, concave. All right, so f, f of k is concave. And then it's minus a linear function. So it's actually going to be concave, but it, eventually the linear function has to win out. So it's going to be like a trajectory, basically. So it's going to be a concave function that's going to eventually impact the x-axis once again. And it's going to start at zero, critically. Okay. So um, now, uh, I, I, I'm not, the, the thing is that we, we never actually go out way into the where you hit the x-axis zone. Because at that point, you're, the, when you hit the x-axis, that means you're consuming nothing and you're investing everything you have to get that super maximum level of capital beyond even the golden rule. We're like way out there, all right? So we're not going to go there because we need to focus on sort of more realistic stuff. I mean, okay, I, I guess we could. Why not? Okay, so so that, that would be hypothetically if we went all the way up. But we're going to focus in on sort of the left-hand side. Everything's going to be happening uh, to the left of this peak, which is here, let's say, kind of a broad plateau, but you know, everything's going to be happening on the left side of that area. And we can prove that, okay, because, uh, let's see, um, so that peak occurs at, that peak occurs where f prime of k, we can do this, okay, where, where is the peak, the, the, first of all, this is, this is the, C, the k dot equals zero line. Okay, now um, that's going to have a peak where, well, wherever f prime of k is equal to delta plus n, right? Because that's that's the derivative of this function here, okay? So we plotted this here. Take the, the where that maxes out is going to be f prime of k equals delta plus n. Just taking that derivative, okay? That's this point, like it's right here, basically. Um, now we know that k star satisfies f prime of k equals delta plus rho. These two are the same. This equation is the same as this one, except we're replacing rho plus with n. We know things about rho and n, right? We know that rho is bigger than n. We also know that f prime is a monotone function. In fact, it's strictly decreasing because it's con because f is concave, right? So, combining those facts um, will give us the answer and the, the way we can do it is so this is um, let's call this like oh no it just like randomly turns on the eraser for me let's call that that point is like k hat all right so this is like k hat here okay let's call that k hat um, and then we have f prime of k star is equal to delta plus rho Okay. Uh, rho is greater than n, so the top one is bigger than the bottom one, right? So then f prime of k star is bigger than f prime of k hat, which means that k star is less than k hat because k prime is f prime is actually decreasing because f is kind of you flip the you flip the inequality because it's decreasing rather than increasing. Okay, so k star is less than k hat. We should have a hat. Um, so that's what we see visually there. Okay, so we, we know we're going to be on the left-hand side of that peak, which is why we, we kind of ignore the rest. All right. Um, cool. All right. So then uh, I'm going to try and be like moderate fancy here. Okay, so that now the question is um, how does everything else play out? Okay. Um, and... Uh, all right, so so the, here's how we do it. Okay, so first of all, this is our equilibrium. Let me let me 
can check it out here. <clears throat> this is our equilibrium. Um, I guess this is this is C star here. Um, that's the intersection point. So K star is is just at that line, and C star is the intersection. Okay. Um, which we can we know how to find algebraically. Um, okay, and so now the question is, how, how do we get there? I guess how do we get to steady state? All right. And the the process here is uh, is kind of what I was describing earlier, which is that we know how to move through this space. The problem is we don't know where to start, and we know how to move through the space. We know where we, where we want to end up, but we don't know where to start. Okay. Because what do we know? We have we have some K0 on hand, right? We're told this is your initial level of capital, all right? Um, so that we know that we're going to start somewhere on this dotted line, this dashed line. The problem is we don't know vertically where we're starting because C0 is a choice, right? And we, haven't, we don't have anything that tells us about C0, right? So we can, we can go through and do it algebraically along the process that I described above, but we can also think about this graphically with these equations, okay? Um, all right, and so 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 that's that's the process. We're gonna choose a bunch of different initial conditions, see where we end up, and kind of characterize what this is gonna look like. Okay, now to figure out where we're going, we need to start drawing more arrows. That's important. Um, so, and essentially, what's gonna happen is, you know, you know, like with a plots, you have like this quadrants, like one, two, three, four. The standard plot, they're they're kind of squares. Um, here we have quadrants, but they're defined by the the inner the the spaces created by the red and blue uh, red and green lines. Okay, so the, you know this is going to be a quadrant. This will be a quadrant. This one will be a quadrant, and this one. So so they're not square, but they're quad we're going to say that they're quadrants because there's four of them. Um, and in each of those, okay, these lines demarcate when you're moving up or down in each of the C and K spaces. And so each quadrant is like a combination of, you know, C is going up, K is going down, or vice versa, right? So there's four possibilities for like the bulk directions that we could be moving. So let's just map it out. Okay, let's let's start over here because it's, it's empty space. Okay, so what's going to happen in this quadrant? Okay, so we're above, this is confusing. Okay, let's start with the, let's start with C dot. So C dot equals zero here. When we're in a low level of K, uh, okay, we, we can think, so so there's a, there's a k where c dot equals zero. If k is lower, okay, then that interest rate's going to be well. Then f prime is going to be higher. Okay, so remember, I need a little bit here. When k is lower, f prime is going to be higher, and so c dot's going to be larger. Okay. When k is higher. That f prime is going to be lower, and so see that's going to be smaller. So up here, um, I'm going to draw it like right here. We're going to be moving down, okay? And that is true. I'm checking with my slides here just in case I, I get confused. We're going to be moving down, right? Because because it's a high k, hence low f prime, hence f prime of k minus delta plus minus rho is is negative, okay? So we're moving down, that's why we're in C space, so I'm drawing a vertical down arrow. And then how are we moving in K space? Okay, so in K space, you have to think about what side of the K dot equals zero line you're where. We're, in, we're high in K space, okay? So here, we're, uh, so this line defines the red line, okay? And remember, it's, it's actually, you need to think about it in terms of K dot. Um, this is, this is that red line, okay? And if C is higher, right, so we're above the red line, then this thing is gonna be more negative. Okay, so K dot is gonna be negative, okay? So the way I'm gonna draw it is like this. So you can draw these little kind of glyphs. Uh, this is saying we're moving left down in K space and down, down in C space, okay? So that's one quadrant. And that's going to apply anywhere in um, this whole area here. Okay, so we can we can do that for for the other ones. Okay, so um, let's see. So so in the let's let's move down to this quadrant here. Okay, so here uh, we're on the right side of that green line. Okay, so we're going to be moving down. Uh oh, 
and moving down, okay? But we're on the opposite side of the red line, okay? So instead of moving left, we're going to be moving right, okay? This is kind of confusing, but like I'm almost out of time here, so I need to, I'm going to pick up the pace. But you, you can think through it after class, okay? So green line says we're, whether we're going up or down, and we're on the same side of the green line. Red line says whether we're moving left or right in case space, and so we should just flip that, okay? Okay. Um, Okay, then let's jump over to the top left, over here. Okay, so here we're on the other side of that uh, green line, so our C direction flips. But we're on the same side of the red line, so the K direction should be the same. So we're gonna be moving left, okay? And then uh, down here, right, we're on the same side of the green line, but the K direction should have flipped. So we're going to be like this, okay? Right, so that's those are our directions for each quadrant, okay? And essentially, and the diagonals quadrants, we're moving kind of in, um, but then on the off diagonal quadrants, we're moving out. So this is, it's hard to see, but it, it, this is what you'd call like a saddle path dynamic because it's not like you just always converge towards steady state regards where you are. We're gonna diverge almost always, okay? Um, so it's sort of unstable. It's half unstable, okay? All right, so let me just draw these paths because I only have two minutes and then we can we can go from there. Okay, so if you start, <clears throat> let's say we started above the red line. For, we're choosing C0 now, okay? We start above the red line, but we need to move off and left. So we're actually just gonna like, and there's, there's nothing stopping us from K positive. So we're actually just gonna burst right through that uh, y-axis, which is bad. We can't have negative k. So that's like immediately, that, that's like no go zone there, okay? Um, <clears throat> let's say we start like pretty close to the to the red line up here. Well, we're gonna move up and right initially. That's That arrow down there tells us that because we're in that quadrant. We know that on the red line itself, k dot equals zero. So we're not moving around horizontally on the red line. We're only moving vertically. And then we're gonna move up and left. So the, the sort of path that is consistent with that would be something like this. Okay, and it would probably just keep going. So we, we, we have constraints is that we have to be moving vertically through the red line and horizontally through the green line, and we have to be moving in the right direction, and that's exactly sort of the path that'll do that. Okay, turns out that path was too high, and we, we, we broke through the red line and, and went off to negative K, which is bad again. Let's do the other extreme, a fairly low level for C0. Okay, so in this case, again, we have to move like this. We have to cross the green line horizontally this time. And then here, we're just gonna kind of go off into like wherever, over there. Okay, because we have to be moving down and right. We can never go up from here. Certainly we can't get to steady state. We can't get in this region. We have to be moving down and right. In this place okay so we're going to converge down there this is like this is going to be actually violating the transversality condition um in the long run that is complicated and we don't have much time we have zero minutes left in class so we're, we're, we'll get into that next time Just don't don't worry about it too much okay um and then of course there's that perfect spot right where it's like uh we're like Basically, just hit it. That looks very linear and straight. It's not. It's not generally going to be linear and straight. But there's going to be some precise single value for C zero that'll get us exactly to state. Anything else, you're gonna just. You maybe you'll get like ninety percent of the way there, but then yeah, you'll you'll take a exit thirty five. Boom, you're in Erie for some reason. Who knows? Okay. Um, other side, you'll just you'll kind of veer off at the end. Okay, and it's actually unstable. Like it's numerically unstable. If you try to compute this stuff forward you'll almost get there and then boom, you go off to infinity. Okay, so it's it's not, numerically, you, you would not want to use this approach to solve it because it's very unstable. Okay, so, but there is, um, you know, uh, theoretically, a line there and exists, right? Um, you, go through, you can do the exact same thing if you start with a relatively high, so you can start with K above steady state, which would mean you'd start over like, you know, somewhere over here, let's say. You can do the exact same stuff, and you, you'll you'll generate another path, okay? If you, if you if you look at it from that side, like you had the like dashed line here, choosing C zero, you go through the same logic. You, you're going to have one exact point, okay? And so for every K zero, there's exactly one C zero, which is the that'll get you to steady state, and that's the optimum, okay? So this line here, 
is the so-called optimum, all right? And that, that, that would be actually what you choose if you were an optimizing. That, so that, that would be the equilibrium, okay? That's the equilibrium of the whole model, all right? So that the agent chooses that C. And you converge at some rate. Eventually, you always end up at steady state, okay? So that's the basic idea. I mean, you can draw this graph and to intuit through why why you have to choose one thing. And but the critical thing is that um, the system is actually unstable, sort of partially unstable, and that instability means that you have to choose ex th that there's only one C, which is in equilibrium. If it were stable, you could choose any C, and you just kind of like end up there no matter what, which would be weird, right? You, we, we actually would we want to have a specific prediction, so sort of counterintuitively you want to have instability or partial instability in the system, okay? So it's, it, it, ex ante, you would assume, oh, well, we should have a stable system, but actually th this this puts constraints on things such that you only have one outcome, okay? So uh, yeah, so next time we'll go through kind of the, how do you do comparative statics in this graphical framework and also sort of the actual uh, proper stability analysis and stuff like that, okay? But this is, I mean, yeah. So I would go through, if, if you have time, go through this graph, just how to construct it, maybe try looking at the case where you have a high uh, initial capital above steady state and, and see if you can get all the, the lines to, to go in the right direction. Okay. Alrighty. Um, that's all I got for today. Uh, I guess I'll see you guys on Thursday.